I've basically been raised in a fescue culture. I was born in 1947. In 1948, they planted the first field of fescue in Texas County. Uh, we went from there to almost really a dominant fescue at this point. Through all those years, we've learned to adapt to fescue and its faults and its, uh, its good and its bad. We started out, you needed a English lawn look. Uh, you could have heavy use of fertilizer, English lawn look, no, absolutely no broom sage in the field at all, or you just wasn't managing right. Uh, and you wanted it short, this manicured look. Uh, we went from that, our paradigm now has changed to exactly the opposite. We like to go back to the multi-species, diverse native uh, look where you got multiple species in the, in the forage base. When you only have a monoculture in a pasture, you have to supplement it a lot of times with uh, purchased fertilizers. Whereas when you go to multiple species and you got something working every day, I mean, the sun shines pretty well every day of the year and uh, it, uh, it, you know, it's free fertilizer. So as long as we got something capturing that solar energy, uh, daily, we've got a much more manageable, much more sustainable system. We'd like to, this stream to run better, wouldn't we? Mm -hmm. And all summer long, and we could have those fish again. Mm -hmm. And there was a spring right behind us here where there was a homestead here, an old house, and that was their water supply. And it, when the settlers came here, my grandpa farmed these bottoms here, and he used that for his drinking water. When he'd get to this end of the field, he could get a drink there. Now you don't see any watercress there at all. The spring is pretty well filled up with gravel and doesn't run much at all. As the settlers came here, what they, the system that was in place at that time was diverse natives and mostly in the Ozarks would have been a savanna situation with scattered trees, but the wildflowers, the grasses, the forbs growing between them. Uh, numerous stories about you could just take a team in a wagon and pretty well drive through the woodland or the savanna anywhere you wanted to go at that time. But with when they came uh, back to subsistence farming, open range, uh, we we basically destroyed that. You know, they're ready, they're ready to move. So uh, I think if we take it loose like you're saying it. Probably won't quite reach that other post over there. Probably not, but you put a post pretty close. Yeah, you can put one in there to make it work. Next to one here if you want to for that. You know. As far as the quality of this stuff, uh, this diverse natives, when we're grazing it, it seems to be much better than uh, when we're grazing monocultures of even natives native monocultures, but especially the fescue. Uh, the gains are better, the cattle seem to be more contented. The uh, cattle will be standing out, out there grazing in the middle of the day rather than being shaded up or, or standing in the pond. And if cattle are grazing, they're gonna, the performance will be much better. So livestock have the ability to balance their diet if given the option of different things. These different plants have different contents of protein or energy and other things uh, that they need in their diet. And if they've got the option, they'll balance their diet among several different plants. And we planted 100 here, so there's a lot of different options out here in the diverse native grassland. When we're looking for animal performance, we're looking for forage quality. And when uh, we've got something green and growing at different stages of maturity on every acre or square foot of land, then there is always something out there to eat that's, that's good quality so we can get good performance. Even if some things have gotten past us, 
there'll be something there that is is good so when you've got a fescue based pasture system where it's primarily fescue you've got two or three pretty big problems there one is it's early maturing putting out a seed head and and quality is going down in may so then you've got the rest of the summer with poor quality forage and actually a forage that's going dormant also it's got endophyte or ergovaline is a toxic substance within Kentucky 31 fescue that causes the cattle to actually overheat and they're standing in the shade or standing in the pond and just generally giving you poor performance. So in 2014, we were grazing. We had, a, had another farm leased over here that was fescue, and we grazed that most of the summer. We didn't wind up grazing a lot of natives, and it was before this patch of diverse natives was going good. And our cattle performance was not very good. Our uh, conception rate was 64% and that it, we'd been breeding while we were grazing fescue in the summer. And then our weaning weights uh, improved substantially. The next year we grazed the diverse natives here and some other native fields and kept them off of fescue anyway most of the summer. And our weaning weights were 74 pounds heavier that fall and our conception rate was 97%, which would be a 33% increase over the previous year. As far as the comparison of Kentucky 31 pastures to diverse natives, it's hardly a comparison with the uh, diverse natives. There's always something good to eat out there and the gains are higher and the conception rates are higher. Why should we be interested in soil health? Soil health actually changed my life. It changed the way I looked at agriculture in general, period. Because with soil health, you begin to understand how the soil works. And if you understand how the soil works, you'll understand how the ecology works. It changes people's lives. It's changed people's farms and ranches. It's allowed them to be able to keep their farms and ranches because the healthier the soil, the further they got away from using chemicals and being dependent on petroleum-based inputs. We're going to measure the integrity of the soil. It is only one indicator. There are many indicators of health. Just like when you go to the doctor, he does a blood sample, urine sample, fecal sample. He does all kinds of samples. Why? Because you are complex. They're indicators of health. This is one indicator of health. Now here's what's gonna happen. They're gonna gently drop these clods, these peds into the water, and if it falls apart, water's gonna rush in to fill the pore spaces. If it starts to fall apart, the soil is losing its integrity. What is occurring, ladies and gentlemen, look at this, look at the native, look at these grass systems. Notice how incredible these are. These soils are no longer the same biologically. The mineralogy hasn't changed, but biologically they have changed. This system is in balance. It has more fungus. It has more diversity. Very less disturbance. This system is bacteria dominant and the one that Anna's holding is bacteria dominant. It has shifted. The extensive tillage has diminished the fungal population. The reason why we want to go back to mimicking nature and watching and observe her, she's incredibly elegant and efficient. There's no waste in it. It captures energy incredibly efficient. If we would move our agro ecosystems and our farming and ranching more the way nature does things, we could save huge amounts of energy. We could have healthier people, have a healthier landscape. We can fix the climate. That's the reason, restoring the land restoring the soil, and that's where it starts off. Through the years, we as, in the human race, we've had, we've been enamored with monoculture, single species. 
because for us in our psyche, even our lawns are pretty much monoculture. We, we like that. We've had that issue since the 1700s or even before. The problem with monoculture is they're very limiting. And if you keep growing the same thing over and over, the natural system doesn't like that because the template embraces diversity. Diversity is the conduit for energy to flow through the whole system. So diversity is incredibly powerful. Each plant is different. Each plant captures energy different. Each plant leaks different exudates or different carbon compounds. Every plant does something different to the soil ecosystem. Diversity is powerful. Diversity in humans, diversity in, in, in um, animals. Diversity is the major way nature does business. And to me, this is probably one of the more, another very powerful um, demonstration to show, I wanna manage my grass height. It's incredibly important how you manage it. And it's incredibly important once you get corn and soybean out that you cover the soil and never leave it bare. One of the biggest enemies on this planet is bare soil. It is destructive because there's no energy flow going back to the system. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. I learned this from Dr. Chris Nichols and I kind of modified it. She's a, she's a soil microbiologist, she used to work for ARS. What I want these guys to do is I want them to go ahead and swish this really violently and start mopping the soil off with the water. Go ahead. Notice the fescue and look at, the, look at that white frothy material and look at here on the warm seasons also. Those are these incredible uh, nitrogenous and carbonaceous compounds. There are hundreds of compounds that have been com converted. Sugars, carbohydrates, proteins, nucleotides, all these, they even have what you call negative communication molecules. It's called allelopathic chemicals. Plants communicate with each other and say, oh, don't get too close to me. They will excrete these powerful compounds. These compounds are leaked into the soil for what reason, Chris? They're bartering. Plants are microbial obligates. What does that mean? I, my wife's name is Sonia. I'm a Sonia obligate. I can't function without my wife. How do you start down the journey of soul health? The most critical thing is change the way you think. Be exposed to the right people, go to the right classes, educate yourself. I would say go find a class, go look at the literature, go into YouTube. We have huge amounts of, of um, soil health videos. Listen to people like Gabe Brown, some of these ranchers that have been applying it for the last 10 or 15 years and how it's changed their operation. So the journey begins right between the years. If you're not willing to change your filters and the way, the way you look at the natural system, you'll never get it. You'll never benefit uh, from the natural system. And what we're teaching producers, learn how to emulate it, learn how to nurture it, learn how to love the natural system, and learn how to understand it. That's the silver bullet we've been saying. Emulate it, don't work against it. So go get educated, start learning. One of the great things about bow hunting and the diverse native uh, plantings is that there's lots of cover so the deer and other wildlife feel secure um, in the area and it, plus it provides a lot of great uh, food for them to eat as well. The turkeys like the area so well because they like to roost in the trees um, close to the planting and fly down in it. And they like to forage in the plantings and eat the bugs and peck around on um, the stuff that the cows have left over. Plus they feel secure in the area as well with all the tall grasses and the trees around. Unlike fescue pastures, I believe that the uh, diverse native plantings um, have benefits not only for the farmer because they get to graze their cattle in that, but it's also a benefit to me as a hunter as well because I get to enjoy the wildlife. I'm a wildlife management biologist with the Missouri Department of Conservation. Um, manage several public lands in, in three different counties and included in that are some 
some remnant prairies, some native prairies that are high diverse native grasslands. And on those grasslands, some of those I, I graze. And we choose to graze for a, a variety of reasons, but for one, it represents a historical disturbance. Um, all of our native grasslands in this part of the country evolved with both fire and grazing. So the overall wildlife impact on grazed native grasslands to me um, is significant for most species. And I think it all trails back to the diversity. Anytime we increase plant diversity, we're increasing insect diversity. So specifically for birds, a lot of young birds, or even adult birds, but in the case of say bobwhite quail, the young birds live almost exclusively on insects. So it's almost, think of a, a chain of plants results in a chain of insects. And the more the diversity is, the more s selection options these birds have as they're, as they're growing. So they have different size insects, they also have different species. And each species of insects has different protein levels, different lipid levels, all these things that these birds know they need to survive and be more healthy. That goes the same for a variety of species. Even deer, for example, on our prairies, the higher plant diversity, the more selectivity they can have. And they can pick and choose which plants they want to eat instead of forcing them to eat only a certain thing in a food plot. Or uh, if we have a very limited three or four species planting, the, the native food is pretty limited and we're forcing them to eat that or seek elsewhere. On these native prairies and these diverse grasslands, they have everything they could ever want. The prairie soils that are so productive for us agriculturally are very high on organic matter. This organic matter comes from having grown prairie plants, grassland plants on it for many, many years. And as those plants grow, uh, the tops of course become organic matter after they have been through a season, but also those roots as they regenerate and grow new roots, those old roots become organic matter that become the sponge that holds nutrients and water for the soil. Functional diversity is a fancy term, just meaning we want different plants that fill different functions in the grassland. For example, we want deep-rooted plants and shallow-rooted plants. We want plants that grow early in the cool season and we want plants that grow later in the warm season. We want this diversity of plants, not only below ground, but above ground, because that will give us the maximum production from our plants. We also want to consider and include legumes in there because, of course, they provide the free fertilizer, free nitrogen fertilizer. We just, a diversity of plants is going to ensure that we get maximum production out of our diverse native grassland. Soil armor is what covers the soil and protects the soil. It's like the mulch in a garden. Mulch in a garden or wood chips in a flower bed prevent the moisture from escaping because they're covering the soil and protecting it. This armor is really important to plants because it is protecting that soil and keeping the, the water in the soil and also keeping the microbes healthy and functioning. Without that active, that available water, the microbes can't function just as the plants can't function. So we wrote a conservation innovation grant sponsored by the uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service. The Missouri Department of Conservation also kicked in some money to help us plant these 100 species of diverse natives for grazing and for pollinators. The inspiration for planting this diverse native grassland was actually a study done uh, at the University of Minnesota by Dr. David Tillman. And there they had uh, from one to 16 species that they randomly chose for these plots to plant and then they planted these to, to this diversity or to single species uh, and they measured the biomass from these. And what they found out was that the 16 species of diversity uh, randomly chosen was 238 percent more productive than switchgrass. And switchgrass is a native grass and it is known as the biomass king of the natives. I began to wonder, how can we get to 238% more production? So I began to look at the land as a solar collector. 
And knowing plants, I knew there were some that were cool season in nature that greened up early in the springtime. In fact, they greened up in the fall and then they went through winter and they were ready to grow in the, early in the spring. They make their seeds early in the spring. And I also realized, of course, that there were warm season grasses and that these growing side by side kept the solar collector, kept the ground photosynthesizing all, se or all season long. So I've begun to see, you know, the advantage of having all this diversity, you know, within the square foot. So it's not only the solar collector and the deep roots, but it's the, um, it's as these plants grow, each one in their own season, utilizing water, as cattle graze these plants, these nutrients then are recycled, you know, to the next growing plant. So the, the manure and the urine is, is broken down and used fa fairly quickly. Not only do we have nutrient cycling above ground as we graze these plants, but we also have nutrients being moved around, you know, underground with the mycorrhizal fungi. And when a plant, you know, doesn't need a nutrient because it's not growing, I can see that these mycorrhizal fungi are moving these nutrients around from one class of plants to another. I like diverse natives. I don't think there's many conservation practices that are actually good for the land, good for the wildlife, and good for the people. And that is why I like diverse natives for grazing, is because it's good for all three components. And, uh, and there's a lot of uh, benefits to society as well. We have you know, less flooding, we have more pollinators, and these are the things that diverse natives can deliver.